Now, there are seven Rosicrucian stages of higher knowledge. The first stage in the Rosicrucian way is the study of spiritual science. Now, we're not talking about something clairvoyant here. We're talking about literally studying spiritual text. First part of it is to develop our capacity to think logically. Now, in most spiritual circles today, in Western metaphysics, we look at things that are intellectual or logical as somehow lower than things that are spiritual. But that was not how it was understood in the original traditions. They understood the capacity to think logically as a superpower that would allow you to completely transform nature and to use all the forces of nature. And that's what it's done. We're harnessing the forces of nature more and more through the capacity to think logically. Also, the capacity to think logically allows us to become self-aware to a deeper level and to guide our own lives. If you can't think logically, how can you act without a guru? You'd have to have a guru to tell you what to do, like when you're one year old and you need a parent to show you what direction to go. You have to be able to think logically and evaluate. And what's hidden behind it at the deeper level when you take off one of the veils is that the study of spiritual science allows you to put into your mind an understanding of a particular structure. Any pattern is related to sacred geometry. That pattern is related to the mind of God. So, as a practical matter, when you study spiritual science, you understand different levels of consciousness, different spiritual planes, different human subtle bodies, the evolution over great periods of time. Those actually put a structure in your consciousness that allow higher spiritual beings to tell you more. Higher spiritual beings can give us information about what we need to do with our lives to help other people, all kinds of great processes. So the study of spiritual science is to actually lay down contextual foundations in our thinking, in our mind, that these spiritual beings can then come in and when we're meditating or we're relaxed, all of a sudden things start to click internally. We get these downloads that happen in a second. Second stage is called acquiring imaginative knowledge. This is referred to as imagination with a capital I by the Rosicrucians. At this stage, we begin to develop a clairvoyant perception that's related to the faculty of sight. So we can actually perceive things in the non-physical world in a way that is spiritually similar to in the physical world. If you say somebody is visual or auditory or kinesthetic, so one person primarily processes information through the eyes, they're visual, through the ears, they're auditory, through feeling, they're kinesthetic. The exact same thing is true spiritually. Some people will process the clairvoyance primarily through a type of internal sight, and they see all these images on their mental screen. A lot of those images are not actually present in the spiritual world, but they're how they clothe non-physical realities so they can access it and they can work with it. And so that's the imagination stage. We can now see non-physical realities in the mind's eye. We can't see with the physical eyes that there's an angelic being in front of us, but in the mind's eye we can begin to perceive that form. We might clothe it in different ways. If I'm a Tibetan, I might see it as a blue-skinned being above the floor with a radiance of light, etc. And if I'm a Christian Jew Muslim, I might see it as a great being of light with these huge wings and maybe if it's a higher hierarchy, instead of two wings, it has six wings like the seraphim or whatever it might be. But it's a way to represent seeing these non-physical forces. The next stage is reading the occult script. Say that this is another type of clairvoyant perception that the Rosicrucians call inspiration with a capital I. This is a type of spiritual hearing. This is what is classically called, uh, basically, hearing the tones of the universe, hearing these great cosmic symphonies around us all the time, hearing the symphony of the spheres. And so with this, we are able to understand higher realities through tones. So people that are musicians or really like music, you know that if you watch a movie, depending on the soundtrack, the exact same scene is a tragedy or a comedy. Depending on the sound, it tells you what the emotional content is. The same thing is true here. Rather than seeing a visual image of a being, one would hear a tone coming from the being, and the tone would give you a quality of the being's internal nature. Everything tones and resounds musically in a great harmony. And we also, of course, do this all the time in our daily life when you hear somebody's voice. People's voices have a tone. That tone carries a part of their intrinsic spiritual nature. And then what was called living into the spiritual environment. And this is also known by the Rosicrucians as intuition with a capital I. This intuition is the ability to actually uh, feel and interact with higher spiritual realities through how things feel internally. And so it's like a kinesthetic person. 
they have to feel something, they have to touch it. Now, this stage is something that actually allows us, you see that this is actually at a deeper stage than the imagination stage, seeing the image. Because as we go into higher and higher planes, we're going to have some of these levels drop away. And so to give you an example of that, as we go to what we call the astral plane, the astral plane, basically a realm of images. And you see then with color and light. A higher plane past that, we primarily don't see things, but we hear the tones. At a higher plane closer to the Godhead beyond that, then we primarily can experience it through intuition. And with that, we actually feel the nature of the beings, the planes, etc., that we're connecting to. You have it as an internal knowledge inside of you. It's no longer outside, it's inside. Like they say in the Indian tradition, that art thou, you are that. You know internally the exact nature of the thing that you're connecting with. In the physical world, physical bodies are always separate. We can never fully interpenetrate. But in higher spiritual planes, that's not true. You can access what appears to be a spiritual being on a higher plane that appears to be one being. And then it begins to peel out one being after another out of the composite being because these beings can actually move into one composite being at a higher level. It's not like the physical plane. There's no physical separation. If they are the same resonant quality, they can become one composite being, uh, a idea sometimes called combinescence. Then the next stage is knowledge of the relations between the macrocosm and the microcosm. Now we understand the way that the higher spiritual world and the physical world fit together. It's a continuum. They're not really separate. The astral world is not something out there. The astral world is all around and inside of us all the time. We begin to understand the way macrocosm and microcosm fit together. And then the next stage, we actually have a union with the macrocosm. We can connect to the higher macrocosmic forces. And this is related to higher stages of alchemy, some of the teachings you find in Taoist yoga, a lot of different traditions, when there's actually a union with the macrocosmic forces. And then the final stage is uh, given different terminology in different texts. In one, they would refer to it as attaining blissfulness in God. Another would call it unifying the earlier stages. But essentially at this point of being able to unify with the macrocosm, there is not a separation of oneself from the Godhead. One can completely unify with the nature of the Godhead that's inside of our I Am presence. And this happens as a totality after the transformation of the other lower bodies. So this is the general sense of the seven Rosicrucian stages. So Rudolf Steiner, a remarkable uh, teacher living in Austria, who again, from my perspective, if you study his works, was really the most advanced Rosicrucian ever to teach publicly. It doesn't mean he was ever the most, the most advanced Rosicrucian of all time, but he was the most advanced one that ever was like publicly out giving talks and doing these types of things. For those of you that know about the work of Rudolf Steiner, uh, he lived from 1861 to 1925, and he left behind over 350 volumes of spiritual text. And there's material in those 350 volumes that you won't find anywhere else in print, having to do with initiation teachings of different traditions over time. Some really deep stuff, really remarkable. You have to get a little bit of a foundation under your belt sometimes to understand what he's talking about in the more advanced works, like anything else. So, Steiner himself actually ran an initiation school within Rosicrucianism from 1904 to 1914, uh, mostly in Germany and Switzerland. And the people that joined this school were meant to go through a particular path of development. But because it's so individual in its nature, Steiner would give different exercises to different people, depending on their structure and what they're developing toward. And so, they actually had four different pathways you could enter in on when you began. The first pathway was called the General Discipline, and it was somewhat similar to classical Hindu or Buddhist types of approaches. The General Discipline that he had in his school was things like you would meditate at certain times of the day, you do various types of self-observation, uh, you would go through a very grounded day-to-day -day process of spiritual work, spiritual study, things of that kind. The other three paths were a bit more specialized. The first one is a path that is mostly for people that are in the thinking pole, in the head. And that was called the Pythagorean, or the intellect, intellectual or art pathway. For those of you that have a background in sacred geometry or the Pythagorean work, the Pythagorean school was one that taught types of science and art 
based on classical spiritual teachings, mostly from Egypt. Uh, Pythagoras was actually trained in Egypt and in Babylon. Uh, I'm not going into all the details of that, but the basic idea is that if you look at the Pythagorean work, it's all related to sacred geometry, sacred number, various types of patterns in the world, and hidden within it are secrets of things like resonance and harmonics. Resonance is the process with which whatever energy quality we're holding at whatever level, whether it's within our energy body, emotional body, mental body, etc., whatever that energy quality is will resonate like a tuning fork with other beings, processes, planes of the same nature. And harmonics is where that resonance doesn't only take place on the physical plane, it can take place across multiple octaves expressed scientifically, but spiritually it means that that resonance can be between something here on the physical world and something in higher spiritual worlds. And so resonance and harmonics is all through the Pythagorean work. So a person on this pathway, they would definitely be studying things like sacred geometry. They'd be understanding the intellectual teachings. They'd be understanding the uh, patterns of creation and also working with them in art, directly expressing them, understanding them through doing to a certain extent. And so what this is meant to do is it illuminates the thinking Again, not as just a type of intellectual activity, but to where the intellect develops to where it actually becomes clairvoyant. And so when we talk about something like sacred geometry forms, very commonly when we teach sacred geometry here at the Vesica Institute, the majority of the students that take the class will call to me later and say, you know, I've seen these patterns before. I've seen them in my meditations. I saw this one in my dream. I worked with a teacher in the Himalayas who gave me this pattern or something like this. The patterns are related to direct thought forms of the mind of God that hold pattern the way we discussed before. The second of these was known as the Christian Gnostic or a devotional path. And this was really a heart-based path. It was a path of devotion. This is really a heart-based path. It's, it's about devotional study and prayer of the heart, things of that kind. So we can develop various centers out of the three primary centers. And it's really a question of which one we're crystallizing first. Or we can take what was known as the karma path, or the action path, and that was a path of the will. That was people that really just want to go out and do it. They want to do something, and it's through the actual movement and the activity that they get initiated to a higher level. Something wakes up in them from the actual doing, 